morning. Too much sunshine for you. <laughs> Thank you for coming this morning uh, to our National Science Center in March. I still got to wine. I'm congratulating the die diggers from the date. Yeah, I want to spend a date with you, Wyman. Yeah, that's my dream date to go on a double date with Wyman. Yeah. I lost my job that over the weekend. It was strange. No, you won't. No. I'm not going to lose it too much. As a reminder, we have one more of these coming on April 1st. That's not a joke. And the person coming is named April. No, you can't make this stuff up. All you hear is the armor is just true and real. Um, and you, I think you'll enjoy her talk today. Well. Uh, according to Mark, Amanda, please stand up. Today, Amanda Imhoff has earned a research uh, experience opportunity for undergraduates at the University of Alabama Birmingham in their physics slash chemistry division. Please give her a hand. Bright red, please stand up. And Jesse Poncho has earned one from the Canadian government for the summer. As a self fulfilling prophecy, and then pat myself on the back, I generated a recording of how and why research is important for undergraduates. It's available on most of your Blackboard sites. None of you have talked to me about it, which makes me somewhat sad. Oh, ouch! Please watch that. All of you, except for you seniors who are going away, all of you can do what these two have done. Talk to me, talk to your faculty, talk to them. These are paid opportunities. Now, if you like working retail, I'll get out of your way. But if you want to engage in science and get paid for it, talk to them, talk to me. The one behind me is Samantha Luce Crossan. Samantha was a student just like you at yeah. this same building, the same room. She said, over there. I remember when she got her first date with that guy. It was the talk of Bio 112. <laughs> yeah, it was used to be. <laughs> he said, what? That wasn't with me. Hold on, no, no. <laughs> Samantha was very quiet. And so if you're very quiet, this is going to be you. And she would sit there and she just follow me. And her eyes would just blink the whole time. And then her first test, she got 97%. She apologized to me. Yeah. She, uh, I'll do better next time. I'm going, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I hope so. This is this is it. And then next time, she makes it the same score again. Oh, she seems bright. I'm smart. Samantha came as a, my first year, Samantha came as a visit. And she said she met me. And I said, how'd that go? And she, she kind of paused. Uh-oh. Because it was interesting. It could have been that bad, because she still came. Yeah. All right. One of the great joys of my heart has been to know Samantha. She was a wonderful TA for me. She was a great student. She was a phenomenal research student. I have this lovely picture of her on graduation day with me. It's on my screen. Yeah. 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 I adore Samantha. Listen to what she's done. She's just like you. No matter what you think you can't do, with him, you can do anything. I know that. She lives it. Samantha, go ahead. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Samantha. Thank you for that introduction, Dr. Wyman. Um, just to kind of go off of what he just said, um, I was terrified of this whole thing, terrified of, you know, dealing with people every day because I'm not a very extroverted person. And it turns out that's what I like most about my future career is talking with people and patients and stuff like that so it's kind of incredible how things work out something I thought I'd have to really work at and kind of act through became sort of second nature to me so believe me if you are shy or quiet or feel like you can't do it you definitely can do your side so I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about what uh, how to become a PA or what a PA is um, I don't know I didn't even know what a PA was until uh, my freshman year yeah. of here and I was talking to my good friend Samuel who is also APA and he's like this is what I'm doing I'm like what is that like, oh that sounds great because I didn't really want to go to medical school and the whole process is just long and arduous so I discovered what APA was I'm like that is for me I want to do it I set my mind to it and I did it so I will start um, a little bit about myself I graduated in 2017 from Spring Arbor with the BS in biology health careers um, for two years while well, my husband is getting his master's degree, I worked as a pharmacy technician um, near State College, Pennsylvania. 
Then I went to Grand Valley State University for my PA program and graduated this past December. And currently I'm awaiting starting position as a PA at Ohio State. I know Ohio State, I never would have thought I'd be working for them. <laughs> but here I am, let alone with cancer patients, which I have told many people I will never work with cancer patients because I don't understand it. Well, here I am working at Ohio State, going to be working in the emergency department and their oncology pod. Um, working with cancer patients in very complex, complex medical care needed. So I started that on May 9. Um, that's part of the reason I'm here today is because I reached out to Dr. Wyman and I'm like, hey, I'm really bored. Um, <laughs> I don't have anything to do. Is there anything I can do to help you out? And he's like, why don't you do a natural science seminar? I'm like, okay. So here I am. Um, these are some obligatory photos. I feel like every graduate from Spring Arbor shows when they give a presentation. So this is circa 2013, nine years ago, when he went to Cedar Bend, this is Core 1. Um, one of my very best friends was in my core with me. Um, this is a promotional photo that was taken, although I don't think it was ever used, uh, with my good friend Haley, who's sitting um, up on the bunk in Siena. Haley is a pharmacist. She um, is completing a pharmacy residency at St. Mary's Hospital in Grand Rapids, Michigan right now. She's married to Samuel, my friend, who's a PA, so that's kind of cool. And that there is Sienna, she is a registered nurse. She works at a dermatology office and she took out my stitches once. So, um, and look at the artwork. <laughs> yeah. Hey, man. Oh, yes. Sienna made that um, periodic table. I will also say I made my own periodic table that I hung up on my wall in my dorm. So, I don't know if that's the rage now, but we all did that. <laughs> I don't know if the Lego periodic table is still upstairs. It is. It Very is. good. So, yeah, that was a photo taken of us, I think, my sophomore or junior year. This is senior year lab photo of me and Sienna, Dr. Wyman, Josie, and Rachel. I'm not sure what Josie and Rachel are doing right now. Josie's going to have a baby soon. Yes, I know. She's just crushing you. Five, three. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, very cool. So that is 2017 or 2016, I believe. This is from my cross-cultural trip to Ecuador. Um, that's Mount Chimborazo. A oh, cool fact, the peak of that mountain is the furthest place from the center of the Earth, although it is not the tallest mountain by sea level regards because it's a vulture on the equator. And this is another lab photo from uh, the zoo. Uh, it's Karen and Hannah and then Josie behind me there. Dr. Ryman took us, and it was a very fun time. And that's me and Dylan. He graduated with a 4.0, one of two people in my class to do that, so very proud of him. Uh, he got his master's degree in music from Penn State and is working on his PhD at Ohio State. So, so some of the things I did at Spring Arbor University, other than make that plate from S. March Lessons, um, That's cool. I was a TA uh, and a lab assistant for Dr. Wyman for multiple classes. Um, I tutored a few classes, like genetics and I don't remember the name of it, it was long, the intro like chem course for nursing students. I tutored that during GLP. What? GLP. Okay. General, General Organic, Organic Biochemistry. Biochemistry. Yeah. Um, that was its first year when I was a tutor for that was the first year of the nursing program here. Um, and I also was a part of the honors program and I did research and wrote uh, a research thesis and I spent like two years working on that, which was fun. Um, I grew to love the lab. And uh, the research I did was actually kind of relevant. It was about um, like nosocomial infections, like urinary tract infections, and some of the uh, uh, organisms involved with that. So that was very cool. I found out I have a typo uh, in my thesis that I found the first time after reading it. I'm turning it in, so that's fun. <laughs> okay, so uh, if you're like me and didn't know what a PA was or a physician assistant, I'll kind of go over that a little bit with you. So I'm going to read the definition provided by APA, which is the American Academy of Physician Assistants. So they are medical providers who um, diagnose illness, develop and manage treatment plans, prescribe medications, and often serve as the patient's principal health care professional. Um, there are thousands of hours of medical training, and PAs are versatile, collaborative, and practice in every state and every medical setting and specialty. And the goal is to improve health care access and quality. It was established in 1967 at Duke University, and there are approximately 150,000 PAs in the United States. Um, I like that meme there. Um, it's not physician's assistant with apostrophe S, so no F, physician assistant. Um, if you add the S, some people will kind of get offended by that. 
Um, I'm not sure the name, the Board of Delegates for AAPA decided to change the name to Physician Associate. That has not really been taken um, fully yet as there would have to be a lot of legislation change, but that may be where the profession is going in the future, sticking with the PA um, acronym there. Um, so PAs are kind of like nurse practitioners, but there are some key differences here. Um, they're both advanced practice providers, or APPs. Um, some people call them mid-level providers, or MLP. Personally, I'm not a fan of that name. It, 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 kind of, it can be derogatory in nature, assuming that you're not kind of at the level to treat patients that you are. Um, so a physician assistant, the degree is a master's level degree. Um, a nurse practitioner can either have a master's or doctorate level advanced nursing degree. PAs are taught sort of like medical students in the medical model of learning. It's very disease focused and problem focused, whereas nurse practitioners are generally taught in the nursing model um, or patient based and you must be an RN before um, being a nurse practitioner. Um, during clinical training, PAs have about 2,000 hours, um, one year full time. Nurse practitioners are typically doing their clinicals part-time and have about 500 to 1,000 clinical hours of training. Um, PAs are taught as ge uh, medical generalists, much like medical students, where you learn, I mean, everything basically. Nurse practitioners are trained in more of a specified path, so um, you get a degree in more of a focused area like family medicine, adult gerontology medicine, neonatal, pediatrics, women's health, or mental health. There still is some room for like wiggle room in there, but you're, you're not taught in the broad sense that PAs are. Um, PAs practice with or under the supervision of a physician. It depends on state laws and institutional like rules. Um, so it can be, in Michigan, for example, a lot of the PAs I was with on rotations pretty much didn't talk to a physician for the whole shift, although they are available. Um, some states require you to have your, like, documentation like co-signed by a physician, it just it really depends on where you are. Nurse practitioners can practice independently in some states without physician authority. Um, in some, uh, the PA profession is pursuing optimal team practice, which isn't necessarily uh, independent practice or full practice authority, but they kind of want to move to allow PAs to practice at the top of their license as opposed to being restricted in some ways depending on the state and institutional laws. Where nurse practitioners, uh, they are trying to achieve full practice authority independent positions. So there's some differences there. Some other differences um, include like certification and some other small things like that, um, like licensing boards, CME, etc. And feel free to ask any questions if you have or clarification or what's the C -E -A -C. Uh, certified certified. certified yep so position assistant certified so there are about 277 PA programs in the United States um, typically 27 months of training um, around the entire year um, a year ish of didactic training plus a year of clinical training it is a master's level degree when it was first established it was just like a certificate it wasn't even a bachelor's degree um, but now it's a master's degree. So to become certified and obtain a license, you must graduate from an accredited PA program and pass the national certification exam. So once you pass that exam, you don't have to take different exams depending on the state. Um, and to maintain that certification, you must complete 100 hours of continuing medical education every two years and take your recertification exam every 10 years. I will say that the recertification exam is changing a little bit. There's now an option to take small bits and pieces throughout instead of taking one big exam every 10 years, which is kind of cool. So PAs do work in every setting and specialty, um, with most PAs working at their hospital or outpatient clinic. This is kind of surprising to me. I didn't know this before I went to school for this, that over 25% of PAs work in surgical subspecialties. Um, and the other majority work in like primary care internal medicine, um, but they do work in all medical specialties. And overall, PAs are well liked by patients. Um, for over the years, it, they hop between like one, two, and three of the number one like best job and best healthcare job. Um, you know, there's not a lot of burnout as much as physicians, so satisfaction with the job is very good. 
and it is a fast growing job as well. Um, so brief history of PA, so like I said, it was founded in 1967, the first class, graduated from Duke University. Um, and kind of over time, PAs became like recognized by the American Medical Association, became authorized to practice in all states, have prescriptive authority in all 50 states. In this, uh, 2017, this is like a kind of a big change in the future of PAs, is the um, House of Delegates passed an optimal team practice, um, like I said before. So why did I choose to become a PA? I felt that it kind of integrated my passion and skills and gifts. So I've always loved science, I've always loved medicine. I almost became a nurse, but um, kind of with some, I decided to come here and they did have a nursing program at that point. So um, I discovered what a PA was and it turned out to fit very well. Um, a lot of problem solving human medicine things I really like. PAs also have, um, a lot of flexibility in their career. They can switch between specialties without any additional training for the most part. Um, it's kind of, you know, get trained on the job because we're trained as medical generalists that allows us to do that. There is no required residency or fellowship, although there are options available if you decide you want to do that, like surgery, residencies, or fellowships, or emergency medicine, some more specialized things like that. It's also less schooling and it's cheaper than medical school, so if that's something that you don't really want to do, this is a great option for you. There are eight PA programs in Michigan. When I applied to schools, there were six. Um, Oakland just started. Oh, they did? Okay. Um, so Concordia and U of M Flint are pretty new. Um, Eastern is pretty new as well, um, but it was there for a couple of years before I applied, and I got signed to Oakland. Um, so yeah, they're opening up all over the place. It's kind of like good and bad. There is a lot of competition for um, clinical placement, so the more schools there are, the more difficult it is for that, so it's kind of like a good and bad thing that more schools are opening up. <clears throat> I think MSC was working on a PA program as well, from what I heard, but it's not right there yet. So I went to Grand Valley. Um, getting into a PA program was very competitive. Um, that's about a 32% acceptance rate overall, so in 2021, there were like 27,000 applicants with almost 9,000 acceptances. 65.3% of, app of applicants every year have applied previously, and the average program acceptance rate is 7%. Um, all these, uh, the numbers I'm gonna get are from an annual report that the Physician Assistant Education Association puts out. It's all over my if you wanna look at that. So this is the median average numbers of accepted students, so when you apply to PA programs, there are a list of requirements that you must meet. Depending on the program, it might change. So one of the major things is patient contact hours or healthcare experience hours. So like the average is around 2,600 um, patient contact hours at time of application, about 340 hours of community service, some shadowing hours, um, median GRE scores are listed there. Um, and GPA is also very important. Um, depending on the school, the weight kind of changes, but you can see there the like, overall GPA on average is 3.5. So I put some of my stats up there just to kind of see my strengths and weaknesses, and it's okay to have weaknesses in your application. So I, one of my biggest strengths, I think, was my GPA. Um, and Grand Valley very much values GPA in their consideration of applicants. That was definitely a strength there. I like to believe I had pretty good letters of recommendation and Dr. Wyman and Dr. Bradovich were me one. Um, I had a pretty good GRE score. I can't remember exactly what it was. Okay. Um, well, Sam, the GRE is in the process of being dumped. Is it really? Yeah. Like for half the schools, Yeah. those schools you put up, half of them used to require the GRE, probably a third of them now require. I'm not too surprised. I forgot to mention, because this wasn't a part of when I was applying, there's kind of a shift towards called the PA CAT. Just kind yeah. of like the MCAT. I'm not sure what school, like how many schools are using that. Three of them in Michigan. Okay, so that's something to consider as well. Um, it's the trend is it's yeah. going more towards that. So instead of like a general like grad school um, like entrance kind of exam, they're shifting more towards like PA CAT. Um, and I did work as a pharmacy technician for my healthcare experience hours. I put that in both as strengths and weaknesses, and I can talk about that in a second. Weaknesses. <laughs> I had no volunteer experience, no shadowing experience, and I didn't have like traditional hands-on 
patient care hours. I had no letter of recommendation from a healthcare professional, other than the pharmacist, but like not a provider. And I worked as a pharmacy technician, which very much limited the schools I could apply to. Um, but I was okay with that because I wanted to go to Grand Valley and they were okay with pharmacy technician. Also, Grand Valley highly values a diverse student population, um, like with background. And so that's something that I talked with one of the professors about and he's like, you know, this could have helped you out here because you have a very different um, healthcare background. And also it was very good knowledge to have throughout. Uh, very, you know, a very solid base of medications, which has helped me in ways I never would have thought. And I had a very horrible written portion of the GRE. I just can't write under pressure. And so that was definitely a weakness. Um, I applied to three schools, um, Grand Valley, Eastern, and Lock Haven University, which is in Pennsylvania. Um, like I said, I knew I wanted to go to Grand Valley, and so I kind of threw almost all of my eggs into one basket and ended up working out. But on average, um, applicants apply to eight programs, and there is no statistical benefit to applying to more than 12 programs. It's very expensive to apply to multiple programs, and um, if you're a good candidate, you, you'll you get accepted to a school. You don't have to apply to, like, there was someone I met at an interview who had applied to 40 schools, and I can't imagine the cost of that. Um, you know, it cost me like maybe $500 to apply to three programs. 40, I cannot even imagine the effort and expense of that. But it only takes one. It only takes one school to accept you to become successful. And there are definitely options out there. Some schools value certain things more than others. So if you can find one that fits you as an applicant, it only takes one school. So the CAFA is like the centralized application for most PA schools use this, about 95% of PA schools use the centralized application. Um, and you basically upload everything there. So you'll have your demographic information, like your grades and transcripts, your testing scores, your employment history, volunteer shadowing history. And one of the big things here is your personal statement, which is your one way to stand out as an applicant and let the school see you as more than just a list of numbers. So this is one of the most important parts of this application. Um, most people spend like months perfecting this. It is 5,000 characters. Um, and of course, the letters of recommendation. Dr. Wyman did help me write my personal statement, so thank you. And um, the interview process, so programs will reach out to applicants with an interview invitation. Um, and each program is different. I had three very different interview experiences from the three schools I interviewed at. Um, some good and some poor. Um, if you want to talk to me about that, I can talk to you about that. I just won't say that on a recruitment <laughs> line. Um, this is an opportunity for you to see the program as well for the program to see you. So they'll mention this a lot, is this is you interviewing the program as well. You don't want to go to a school that does not fit you. Um, it's an opportunity to see what the faculty is like, what the culture is like in the school. You'll typically be able to um, have a tour of the campus or facilities with current students who will kind of tell you like the truth and kind of give you some more information there that faculty might not. Um, <clears throat> for me, this process was one of the most anxiety-inducing times in my life. I remember before my first interview, quick story, uh, there was some communication issues and I ended up having to show up to my first interview blind and call them and say, hey, I'm here, can I still come? And that was, I was sick. I didn't like eat for days before, but I survived it. <laughs> like I tell myself, if you have to, if you're scared, you might as well be scared and accomplish something, then be scared and not do something. That's kind of like the motto I've used to get through some of the most anxiety inducing times of my life. Uh, make sure to prepare ahead of time and have some questions. Um, and try not to be too cliche. Come up with genuine questions that you have about the program because like I said, it's your opportunity to find a more about them as well. And address as business professional if you did not know or were not aware. So I'll talk a little bit about the experience I had while in PA school, although I will say it was not traditional because two years ago we were hit with something called COVID. Yeah. So more than 50% of our didactic education was over Zoom. I will say that Grand Valley was very well equipped to handle this. So we, our last day of school was like on a th Wednesday or Thursday, and by Monday we were all on Zoom being taught that way, which 
I'm sure, I'm not sure how many of people in here had to deal with like that part of COVID, early COVID. Very difficult to learn online. Um, I had a very challenging time. Focus was a huge problem. Um, so I feel like that was definitely a struggle. Um, my lifestyle became a lot more unhealthy. Um, sitting around all day, very difficult. Um, a lot of our, like the experiences that we were supposed to have, we didn't get to have because of COVID. Um, some of the more procedural stuff in lab we didn't get to do. We didn't go out and experience, like we have healthcare experience built into our program. We couldn't do that because of COVID. But we made it through, um, kicking and screaming, but we made it through. Um, our class is lucky not to have been kicked out of clinical rotations like the class above us was, so I'm very fortunate for that. So Grand Valley's program has 16 months of didactic training followed by 12 months of clinical training for a total of 103 credits. Like I said, it's a master's level degree, five and six hundred level classes. Um, there's actually two campuses, um, one in Grand Rapids with 36 students and one in Traverse City with 12 students, and they're connected um, by a hard wire between Grand Rapids and Traverse City. So um, sometimes you would forget that you're separated because their images are projected up on the screen and ours are on their screen. Kind of converse in a way like it's, there's not even distance between, so it's really cool. Um, so classes you'll take a human anatomy with cadaver lab, which was very difficult for me because I'd never taken a cadaver anatomy lab before. Um, medical physiology, clinical applications, which is like the hands-on portion, clinical medicine, pathophysiology, pharmacology, and about other random courses like statistics and stuff like that. Um, the, you need an 80% in your PA classes to continue on and a 75% in non-PA classes which are just anatomy and statistics. So um, it is very difficult, I'm not going to lie. Very challenging, but I, spring offer prepared me very well. There was actually a few semesters here that were more difficult than PA school. So I will thank the professor is sitting here today for that. Um, comparing myself to some other students who you know, went to like Michigan State where the courses may not have been as rigorous, I was very well prepared for that. So thank you. Um, after the didactic portion, you go on to clinical rotations, which was something I was dreading the entire time. Before I even started school, I was stressed about this because I had never had traditional you know, like experiences like a CNA or a medical assistant or an emergency department tech or anything like that. I had never interacted with patients before in my life. I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know how to talk to them. I was like terrified of the patient encounter, which, like I said, became my favorite part. So um, that kind of reinforced the fact that I was made for this. GVSU doesn't have peds? No. They got um, DeVos Hospital right there, for goodness sakes. <laughs> there is also a. Uh, it's a it's a lack of preceptors, and there are a lot of medical students in Grand Rapids. Or MD program, yeah. Um, so we are tested on pediatrics um, through the end of rotation exams, but don't have a set pediatric rotation, um, oh, which is not common. Most schools do. So the core rotations that Grand Valley has um, is like four weeks of behavioral health or psych, four weeks of emergency medicine, eight weeks of family practice, eight weeks of internal medicine, four weeks of rural or underserved medicine, four weeks of general surgery, four weeks of women's health, and then you have eight total weeks of elective rotations. Um, so I did two weeks of pediatric nephrology at home to boss two weeks of urgent care, and I chose to do an additional four weeks of emergency medicine. Um, that was at St. Mary's Hospital in Grand Rapids. Um, there is some wiggle room too, like my internal medicine rotation ended up being four weeks of cardiology and four weeks of urgent care. So that was kind of fluky, but um, honestly, I liked that better than internal medicine. Um, so generally a rotation, it, the experience will vary widely depending on your experience as well as your relationship with your preceptor or preceptors. So, um, um, it can range from you just shadowing to you doing almost everything. And a lot of that depends on, like I said, your level of comfort and their level of comfort with you. Um, and also on the institution you're at because some places have rules. So generally, on a typical clinical rotation day, you know, you get up, you go to your place, um, and the day, you know, you're kind of, it's your training to be a provider. So you'll go in, you'll talk to the patient, get their history, 
So come out, um, we'll do a physical exam. Come out, present the patient case to your preceptor. Um, what you think is, you know, kind of their story. What you think is going on with them. Your assessment and then your plan of care for what you want to do going forward. You go back into the room with your preceptor. You know, sometimes they'll do the same thing all over again. They'll come out, you know, send orders, write your note, um, and go on, on and on and on. Some, some things you do will depend on your rotation, like for example, um, on surgery, you'll go in and you'll assist the surgeon with surgery, which is kind of cool. Um, you will close incisions. Um, some places allow students to intubate the patients. Unfortunately, I never got to do that. Um, you might help or perform in-office surgical like cysts or like homo removal or vasectomies, depending on where you are. Um, uh, throughout my rotations, I've got to administer injections. I got to remove some IUDs, suture lacerations, assist with joint or fracture reduction in the ER. Um, some of my classmates got to insert, like do intubations or insert arterial lines, drain abscesses, and a lot of foreign bodies. <laughs> remove foreign bodies from skin, ears, nose, eyes and other areas. Um, you'll also perform a lot of pelvic exams and pap smears. Um, and if you're lucky, do a few digital rectal exams. Um, some cool <laughs> things I saw while on rotations. Um, I, you, know, I, you can tell my husband, um, talk to him. The days I would come home and be like, oh my gosh, this the coolest thing happened to me. He's like, I don't even want to know about it. <laughs> so um, on Thanksgiving at 1 o'clock in the morning, and I got to witness the, um, in the trauma bay, there was a gunshot went to the abdomen. That was kind of cool. I mean, sorry for him, but um, that was kind of cool to see. Um, uh, when I was in Lansing, there was, not in the hospital, but at a different location, an active shooter, which resulted in multiple level one traumas and the um, car chase that involved multiple car accidents. So that was kind of interesting. Um, uh, a lot of COVID, um, especially toward the later half when I was allowed to kind of see the COVID patients. So a lot of, you know, got a lot of, like, kind of sick satisfaction of doing COVID tests. Um, a lot of COVID tests. Um, got to see some really rare autoimmune diseases, especially in pediatric nephrology. Um, I saw a STEMI in urgent care. Um, like, this is not the place for you. Um, a STEMI is like... ST elevated yeah. myocardial Yeah. So like the big, the big heart attack. Um, she had had four days of symptoms and decided to come to urgent care. I'm like, oh my, <laughs> I know. Um, so that was cool. Um, and not during rotations, but I did get to volunteer at a COVID, COVID-19 vaccine clinic. So I got to um, administer a lot of COVID vaccines, which was very cool. Uh, I'll have some photos here of my experience. Um, I didn't take a lot of photos, so there's not very many. So, um, this picture is me and my friend Rachel at the COVID vaccine clinic. Um, this is us after anatomy lab during PA week, little baby PA students. Uh, this was my last day of rotations, and my friend Rachel also happened to be at that hospital, so we took a photo together. Um, this was before a practicum, which is also my least favorite part of PA school, and not going to lie, COVID made it so we didn't have very many of them, and I was not upset about it. So that is where a standardized patient will come in, and you'll kind of, you know, do your thing um, with a greater in the room with you. Um, this is definitely my time management skills right there. Um, you know, I kind of do it to myself. Um, and this is me taking stitches out of my dog's head. Um, she had a, she's kind of gross. She has a lot of cysts. And so she had them removed, and I got to take the stitches out. Like, so did you, did you do a veterinary rotation as part of PA? No, but I take the stitches out. It's not that hard. So I'm like, why well, take her to the vet? I can just take them out here. I had all my stuff. So that was fun. Um, yeah. I also, I had a lipoma on my neck removed when I was in school, and I kind of joked that if it was any roll to my body, I would have taken it out myself. Um, but it's kind of hard to see the back of your neck, so. And, it, and this is what uh, school did to you, so that's me sleeping on the couch with the dog. Um, this is kind of 
funny to see. This is our first day of classes ever. Um, very young and green. And then this is the last day of our didactic year. As you can see, very large difference. We're wearing masks in that second photo. Um, yeah, it was. It's crazy to think of how far we came between that first and last photo. There. This is some photos of lab. Um, so. Our last semester of didactic, we did get to go back one day a week to school, so we got to do some of the more hands-on stuff that we may have missed earlier. Um, so this is when we practiced like scrubbing for surgery. Um, my favorite lab was like the cast lab, so we got to put on casts and splints and take them off. Very fun. Um, this is before COVID. Um, this is our injection lab. We're practicing injections there. And this is uh, us practicing ultrasounds, also before COVID. We had to practice some intubations as well. Difficult on a dummy. I can't imagine doing it in real life. I don't know. Um, yeah, so some of my favorite memories were during that lab, which unfortunately got cut short because of COVID. Um, so after graduation, kind of gets into real life again. It's a lot of money you'll spend. Um, so you have to take your national board exam, which is called the PANTS. When I say I'm taking the PANTS, people are like, what are you talking about? Um, it's P-A-N-C-E, not P-A-N-T-S. Um, it's 300 questions, one minute per question, five hour exam. Uh, it is nothing compared to what medical students do, so. Um, yeah, so then you take basically the same exam every 10 years for recertification, but that might be changing soon. Um, and then you renew your certification every two years, which also costs money. And then you have to pay to get licensed in the state you're practicing in, which also costs money. And then you have to pay for your DEA certificate, which also costs a lot of money. Um, and you pay for CME. And you pay for CME. Well, there's a lot of options for free CME, which is nice. And depending on where you work, you'll get reimbursed for some of these costs. But um, I probably spent more money in the last couple of months than I did in the last couple of years. They sell all this stuff. And then you gotta get a job. Um, which depending on where you are, it can be kind of challenging. Uh, I know West Michigan, the job market is pretty saturated. Um, and because of COVID, you know, you'd think that because of COVID, there would be a lot more jobs available. But you think about the fact that more elective things are being canceled. So the PAs there are working, you know, instead of working doing in plastic surgery, doing like whatever. They're now working in the ICU, so there's not as many jobs available there. Um, and the more schools there are, the more graduates there are, the more people there are looking for a job. But I mean, it'll happen. Um, it just might take a little bit. Um, yeah, and it's hard as a new grad because you don't have that experience under your belt, but it'll happen. Let me get and a lot of my classmates got jobs from their rotations, so networking is key. Um, if you don't have that available, I mean, it worked for me, so um, yeah. it, it's tough, but, but, but it's, it's definitely possible. Um, another thing to keep in mind is once you graduate, the money doesn't come in right away. Um, a lot of my classmates, you know, got job offers in October, November. They didn't start working until February or March. Uh, I got my offer for my position in February, and I don't start until May 9, so there's a long process depending on where you're working, where you're spending a lot of money and not getting money, so it can be tricky. Uh, a lot of it's to do with like credentialing processes and, you know, getting enrolled in Medicare and all that fun stuff, so, yeah. And of course, the fun part, compensation, so, um, you know, can kind of see there. I'm not going to read off all the numbers, but this is for Michigan, kind of based off of years' experience and what pay you may expect. Although the end isn't super big, so um, you know this isn't like a promise. But this is based on the survey of um, uh, sorry. This is based off of like surveys that are you know PAs fill out. So um, you know it's a decent chunk of change. But you have a lot of debt, so um, yeah, there's a little.
rained all at the end of the road. And this is for Ohio, which is where I'm going to be working, so, yeah. Um, so here's a great resource. If you are interested in being a PA, um, I didn't utilize it, but I found it when I was making this presentation. I had, like, everything you'll need is either a pre-PA student or as a PA student. A lot of resources available there. Um, these are the sources I use. And my contact information, please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions um, about the whole process or what a PA is or anything. Um, I like to think I'm a pretty approachable person, so. Um, i trying to think how much time about 15 minutes. Does anyone have any questions for me? I know I kind of went through that a little quickly. Anything I can clarify? Or... Anyone here want to be a PA?
I never really came up with a good way to study. It changed all the time, and I had attention issues. So it was kind of like, okay, I have to do this or I won't do well. So I, you know, I um, would basically read over lectures again in my notes and stuff. So it didn't really change that much from here, but like I never, I don't have a good answer for that because I don't have very good study. Yeah, I think you're selling yourself a little short. Probably. When I went into the library, it was you and Sam and Haley and Sienna yeah. sitting at a table Usually one of the louder tables. <laughs> but you guys were studying. You were studying yeah. hard. Yeah. I mean, you do study hard, and I think that um, I'm just easily distracted. So maybe spend more time doing things. But yeah, maybe it's fair. Maybe I'm selling myself a little shorter. But yeah. Would you recommend to students that they study in groups? I mean, really, I, I would, yeah. It depends on your. Um, it's your personal, like, what works best for you. Um, that didn't happen as much in, like, my paid program, just because of logistics. Like, we don't live there. Like, here, we live here. I would occasionally study, like, over Zoom with some friends, and it was helpful if you had the same study style. Yeah, just kind of depends on the person. Um, what would you say is, like, the biggest difference in the healthcare setting between, like, the PA and the uh, almost, almost indistinguishable if you're like just watching the practice. There are like differences in education, and it, it just also depends on where you are. Like some places, depending on laws, the nurse practitioner doesn't even need the position. But in every setting I was in, there was almost no difference between practicing as a nurse practitioner as a PA. Kind of two sides with the same point. It's just the way of getting there. Were there any courses at Spring Harbor outside of the sciences that you felt helped you as a PA? Just the um, having a liberal arts education. I could also see a difference between, you know, Myself and other students who went to like a liberal arts college versus someone who just was in the sciences and didn't have as wide of an education. Um, just like the approach of you know how we look at problems from a multi-dimensional way, I can see some differences there. Um, I took rock climbing. That was fun, kind of a way to unwind a little bit. Um, I know, I can't really remember. Why, do you have anything? No. <laughs> okay. Just being up in the PA. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I had to think about that. But. Did you enjoy your senior bank trip? There were a lot of us, like, in sophomores that didn't need to take it. Is senior bank still a thing? We, did, we didn't go because of COVID. Because of COVID. It's <laughs> been moved to the Shendo. That's kind of what I thought, but I don't know if it was already done. Uh, I don't know. The first semester was weird. I, it was just very different than the other parts of my education. I did enjoy it, I guess. I mean, I didn't really, it was freezing cold when we went. Like, I couldn't feel my feet walking from the woods back to wherever. That wasn't very fun. And I don't like not showering, but it was okay. It was a fun, like, bonding experience, I guess, with your core. I mean, it's a, it's a good experience. It has to feel very differently. Like, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. It's, it was such a long time ago, though, that, you know, I can't remember everything about it. Any other questions? So Samantha will be around a bit, so if anyone wants to ask her something that isn't being recorded, we're more than welcome to do so. She just talked more now than her entire first 18 months. <laughs> 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 so true. One of the, one of the worst parts for us mm -hmm. as faculty is you were here for four years. And as much as you drive, some of you drive us nuts, you go, and we don't see you again. And it hurts more than you might suspect. This is why I do this job, right there. Because what she started as, and where she is now, is amazing. And I agree with her. Thank you. You've done awesome. Thank you.